Well, I'm very happy to be here today with James Blackledge, who is the President and CEO of Mutual of Omaha. James and I both have an announcement to make tonight that will have significant impacts on our city now and forever in the future. I also want to welcome all of the partners that are in the room today. We have the Chamber, we have representatives from the Urban Core Committee, philanthropic leaders, and our downtown neighbors. So thank you, all of you, for being here today. We really appreciate it. Um, I think there might be some city council members that are here today. I want to recognize them, too. Thank you for being here. And all of you that are in this room, your support and your collaboration is vital now and for many decades in the future. And we couldn't be making these announcements today without all of you and all of your support. So the first announcement I will make, and that is the city of Omaha is going to go forward and build a streetcar downtown. The question is, well, Bill, Well, I didn't expect that, but thank you for that. That's, that's, it, we're starting out well. Um, and the question is, why now? And so when you look at the development downtown, I look at the streetcar route, is, is I look at the two bookends. And on one end is the Riverfront Park, and the Jean Leahy Mall will be finished, as you know, in May of 2022, this, this spring, um, on 10th Street to one end. And then when we go all the way to the other end, we have Project Next with the Med Center. When you look at the value of these developments, the Riverfront Park and Luminarium, $400 million. Uh, the Mercantile, $500 million. Uh, Millwork District, $300 million. Builders District, $300 million. Capital District, $200 million. The Med Center, $2.5 billion. And when you look at these developments in between those two bookends, you can see how a streetcar is going to connect everything together. Building downtown workforce, attracting and retaining young professionals and talent and business to the urban core is what is going to result with the development that we see occurring downtown, that is planned to occur downtown, and how this streetcar will tie everything together. I have said since 2016, I understood the value of a streetcar. I understood how important it is for downtown development. Because frankly, I think we all know that parking is choking development downtown right now. But I also said I didn't want to raise taxes to pay for it, and nobody has presented to me a plan of how to pay for it. So the Greater Omaha Chamber of Commerce have uh, assembled an urban core committee that has been working for several years now. They presented to us a funding plan that does not include a tax increase. Uh, we have analyzed it. We had a financial team at First National Bank analyze it. We've had D.A. Davidson, our bond counsel, um, analyze it and all say it is very sound, it is very solid, and it will work. The streetcar will maximize parking and additional development and opportunities downtown, and we know that that will happen. First of all, I want to say, too, that I said about in 2016, that we can't go ahead and go forward and build a streetcar. And what my point is, a lot has changed since, since then. We can't build a streetcar when we have streets full of potholes. And we have fulfilled our promise to fix the streets first. And I know you all know that in May of 2020, we passed a $200 million bond issue, and we are fixing our roads. When that bond issue was passed in May, we began work on the roads in June, the very next month. In that short period of time from June to December in 2020, we spent an additional 23 million plus on roads. In 2021, we spent 57 million plus on roads. And in 2022, we have plans to spend 66 million additional on roads just because of that bond issue. And I think you can see those projects all over Omaha. And we indeed are fixing the, the, the problems that we had with our infrastructure. I want to use the Transit Oriented Development, or the TOD, as an example that was passed by the City Council uh, just in, let's see, that was passed uh, last year or two years ago. And with that TOD that was passed, it was October 2020, four projects have already been approved and three more are pending for a value of over $119 million. So you can see how these efforts along, uh, and that's along where the BRT is, how they have really sparked development. There are currently 46 U.S. cities that have or are planning streetcars. And we have done a lot of research on all of this. And research shows that every community 
with a streetcar, development has outperformed the estimates. It hasn't gone the other way. But of the estimates that we had and the other cities had of what would happen around that streetcar line within particularly three blocks, that the estimates of development it, the, it, it have exceeded what they originally projected. So that's really important, too. <clears throat> also, what I think is very important is the federal infrastructure bill that has been passed. And that allows us to immediately look at future routes. You all in your media packet today have a map of where the initial route will be from 10th Street all the way to Saddle Creek and back again. But we can immediately start looking at routes from the north and south because of the federal infrastructure bill. So that will be in our plans in the very near future. Um, I am going to talk in a little bit about how we're going to pay for it because I think that's really important to everybody. I know it's very important to me and the citizens of Omaha. But first, I'm going to call James Blackledge, the president and CEO of, of Mutual of Omaha, to come up and make our second big announcement today. So James. Thank you, Mayor Stothert. Appreciate that. Um, good morning, everyone. It's great to see you all. This is the most popular I've been in years. I don't know what's going on. Uh, we're really excited to share with you some news today. I know probably some of this is a little anticlimactic as some of the news leaked out <coughs> earlier, but uh, let me just make a couple of quick comments and I'll turn it back over to you. Mayor. Since uh, Mutual Omaha's founding back in 1909, we've always uh, been proud of our uh, home base here in Omaha, Nebraska. We've always endeavored to be really good corporate citizens. <clears throat> of course, our growth and success has been indelibly linked to that of the city and its incredible people. Uh, through good times and sometimes challenging ones, we've benefited from our outstanding workforce and strong ties throughout the community. And we're very proud of the role that we played in the growth of this city and the ongoing development. Today, I have some exciting news. Mutual of Omaha will be building uh, a new headquarters tower downtown in downtown Omaha. Uh, we're inspired by the energy in downtown Omaha and we recognize the importance, the, the vital importance of a vibrant urban core to our future. The development of the headquarters towers provides a rare opportunity to create a dynamic workplace for our associates while contributing to the strength of our downtown. We are working closely with the city and also with our developer Lanaha Real Estate Company on our headquarters plan, which will represent a major addition to the Omaha skyline, really on the scale of the first National Bank of Omaha Tower. Based on previously planned relocation of the downtown library, we are focusing on that as the site. Uh, Mutual of Omaha is called Midtown Home since 1940, and we are very invested in its health and growth and development. Our plans envision additional redevelopment of Mutual's current home office, campus, as well as the property that we own to the east of Turner Park. Mayor Stothert's intention to proceed with the development of the modern streetcar system is a key factor in our decision to invest in downtown and downtown headquarters. This plan, these plans represent kind of a rare win-win for the city a significant investment in the vitality of the downtown urban core, as well as the ongoing development in Midtown. Uh, and they are both fueled by the modern streetcar system. Our downtown, downtown headquarters tower is a tangible example of the significant economic development that a streetcar will undoubtedly foster. Thank you, Mayor Stother, for your commitment. Today's announcement is the culmination of careful study and evaluation of our headquarters needs and while we still have many decisions to make, uh, we are excited to bring this announcement to you all today. And now I'd like to turn it back over to the mayor. Thank you. Oh, and look what's right there behind you, oh. too. That's a, that's a really nice picture. When I first saw the renderings of that building, I mean, all you could say is wow. Um, and when you think about the Gene Leahy Mall being finished and standing in the Gene Leahy Mall and looking west and seeing this tower at the end of the Gene Leahy Mall, it certainly will change our skyline forever in the future. And it will be very, very positive for Omaha. The one thing I want to reemphasize that James just said is this building downtown at that site would not be possible without a modern streetcar. It would not be possible. And they, it's contingent upon the streetcar. 
this is not Mutual of Omaha streetcar because this streetcar is going to benefit the development all downtown. But there were probably a good half dozen developers that have expressed interest in the Dale Clark Library site, and none of them could do it without a streetcar. So that's why this is so vitally important as we continue to develop downtown that we are able to move people in and out and around the core. And that's why we're talking about it now, and that's why we're moving forward with it right now. The streetcar will be our next phase, the city's next phase, of what we call our total no mobility system. And total mobility is a combination, and it will be a combination, of the streetcar, the buses, the BRT, of course cars, pedestrians, scooters, um, bike share, all of that combined is part of our total mobility system. The streetcar, as I said, will provide, it will be free, and it'll be easy, and it'll provide access in and out and around the urban core. Um, the streetcar provides um, uh, access then to attractions and to the districts downtown, to employers, employees, entertainment, health care, all of these things. There are some residents that live downtown that may not even or may choose not to have a car. The total mobility system will pay for the operation and maintenance of the streetcar. And I'll get into that in just a second. But a little bit of history, a tremendous amount of work and research and analysis and planning has been going on over the last decade to plan for this. So this is not anything that we just thought of, a, a, you know, a few weeks ago. In 2009 or earlier, the city applied for a federal grant to study the feasibility of a streetcar and the BRT. That was back in 2009. Most recent data shows that Metro ridership on the orbit line is 28 percent higher than the ridership that was on Route 2 compared to the same timeline. Now, of course, on our buses and on the BRT, we had a slump because of COVID, but we had the slump at our airport, too, and that is picking back up again. Since opening in November of 2020, the orbit is on track to surpass half a million cumulative rides by the end of 2022. So it is successful. successful. The initial study, though, that we had said that more work was done to study the cost and financial feasibility of the streetcar. And so that's what we have been doing since 2009. Further studies, though, did show that a streetcar would have, I quote, significant benefit on the urban core, bring jobs back to the urban core, attract younger work workforce, and increase development. In 2018, we did an advanced engineering study of the streetcar to see if it could be built on that proposed route, and we found out that it could. So we analyzed the road, the condition of the road, the need for additional signaling, um, the utilities under the street. We studied everything. And that route that you have in your packet for the map shows that it can be built on that proposed route. It is a three-mile route or three-mile loop. It goes from 10th Street between Harney and Cass, and then Harney and Farnham between 10th and 42nd Street. So that is the original route. However, like I said, we will start looking immediately into plans to expand it north and south. So the most important thing is how do we pay for it? And it's complicated, but I'm going to explain it to you today. And as I said before, a funding plan has been developed and submitted by the Urban Core Committee. Uh, we've had it analyzed, and it is, it is very sound, and it will work. And it is based on TIF. Um, the system does not require a property tax increase. It will not require a sales tax increase, occupation taxes. It does not require any tax increase. The projected cost right now of the streetcar is $306 million, but that includes a 35% contingency. So that's a very, very large contingency, and that means the actual cost of the streetcar is approximately $225 million. So keep that in mind. The TIF that we expect to generate will generate $354 million <coughs> plus a minimum of $354,000. So that is more to pay for the construction of the streetcar and have additional TIF funds that can be used for other TIF eligible expenses. So there are three types of TIF that we are going to use to pay for the construction. And I'll just briefly go over them. Existing TIF, for those that are within three blocks of the route and only with three blocks of the route. What we, pro what we propose doing is increasing the 15-year TIF note to a 20-year TIF note. Now, we can do that by state law. It was changed several years ago for extremely blighted areas that the TIF note could be paid off in 20 instead of 15. If we pay along just along the route within three blocks on either side of the route, 
that additional five years to pay the TIF note back will generate approximately $50 million. The second is new TIF projects. And pro new projects that we know that will develop within three blocks on either side of the route will contribute 25% of their TIF proceeds to the streetcar. We've had meetings with lots of developers that are interested along that route and all say that they would be more than willing to contribute 25% of their TIF proceeds to the construction of the streetcar. That would generate $218 million. And then the third is a TIF district. And modern streetcars, as I said before, have really shown in every city that we studied to cre increase valuation along the line within three blocks between 10 and 30 percent. And we know that is very, very accurate. That value capture of the increased value along the streetcar line should bring in about $86 million. So that together equals $354 million, and that is the minimum amount that we think that it will generate. Um, it is projected, like I said, that there will be enough TIF available for the streetcar, for the construction of the streetcar. And if there, some of our models showed an excess of $400 million that it would generate. And if it does, then we have other proposed uses for that TIF. It has to be TIF eligible expenses as determined by state law. But that could be used for affordable housing. It could be used for two-way or one-way, two-way conversions of our streets downtown, bikeways, um, additional open spaces, pedestrian improvements, et cetera. So whatever is a TIF eligible expense, we're going to look at if there's additional TIF revenue to use it for that. So the question is, this is over a period of time that we would collect the TIF revenue. And so the question is, how do we pay for the construction right now? And the answer is, where do we get the money now is the question. The answer is a combination of special revenue bonds and private placement bonds and philanthropy. Uh, our bond council and our investment advisors have reviewed this. There is definitely a market out there all over the country for special revenue and private placement bonds. And the important thing about this is that the risk is with the bondholder, not the city. So the city is not at risk with the private placement bonds and with the special revenue bonds. The bondholder is. And even James will say that with their investment portfolio with Mutual, they have a lot of private placement bonds in their investment pro portfolio, so they're very attractive to investors. So that's the construction, how we'll pay for the construction. Now we talk about the operation and maintenance. And that's ongoing. Operation and maintenance will cost about, estimates about $6.4 million a year. So how do we pay for that without raising taxes? And the answer is what I said before, our parking and mobility uh, divisions in Enterprise Fund. And that will generate enough money from our parking garages and our parking meters to pay for the operation and maintenance, the $6.4 million annually. Um, and also new garages. You know, we have planned, if you look at our CIP, new garages that we build. We build garages a lot. We, make, we pay it off with the revenue that they generate. And already, you know, we have plans for a garage in Millwork, Hines down at ConAgra campus, Blackstone, UNMC. And all of those new garages we build will only add to the revenue. So we have developed a timeline for the streetcar. It's pretty aggressive, but the design would be in 22 and 23, we would be designing it. Uh, the construction would be in 23 to 25 and plan to open it in 2026. Uh, the council has some actions that they will need, some deadlines that they will have to do some approvals on. And also, we, have, we are planning and we will move forward with creating an authority to run the streetcar. The city of Omaha will own it. We, we don't want to be responsible for running it, so we will create it, an authority. And on that authority, we see it as a seven-member board. The city will have three uh, people that they will, uh, the mayor will recommend, city council will approve. Metro Transit will have three that they will recommend, and then the Urban Corps will have one. So we are in conversation with Metro Transit, and we will be in agreement um, for, for these t this type of uh, an authority to run. Um, we have um, a plan for it to go to the TIF committee and to the planning board and when it will be on city council agenda. But if all, everything goes as planned, that we would have a vote by the city council on May 10th, which is primary election day, I think. So in conclusion about the streetcar, um, from the beginning, it has been expected when we first started talking about the riverfront redevelopment, that all that development downtown 
would generate a lot of interest in new buildings and generating new projects downtown around the Jean Leahy Mall. Um, it is very clear to all of us and to every developer that the lack of parking is really choking development downtown. So now is the time to move forward. Um, there's uh, also a lot of underutilized parking that's available throughout the urban core if it can be accessed. So the streetcar, we look at it as this is the solution to accessing available parking which enables maximum development in our downtown area. And so that, you can see how the conversations that we have had recently about how important it is to move forward with clearing the site where the uh, Dale Clark Library is. Um, our plan is to have the Dale, the, the Dale Clark out of that building by September so we could have it demoed by December of this year so that Mutual can continue to move forward and we can continue on this timeline. And so you can see now, if you look at the big picture, you can see how these are all connected. And like I said before, there, is, there was more than Mutual that was interested in this site. Um, there's a, a, quite a few developers, I'd say at least a half a dozen that have shown interest, but nobody's going to develop in that site or build a tower of this magnitude um, without a streetcar. And that's why these two go together so well and why we're announcing them together right now. So with that, um, James and I are here to answer your questions. There are a lot of people in this audience, like I said, that represent the developer, the chamber, the urban core committee. Um, and, it, you know, if necessary, I could bring them up to answer a question, too. But if you could, when you ask a question, if you could say what your name is, what media outlet you represent, and who you're directing your comment to, I would appreciate it. Easy questions first. <laughs> Mayor Joe Jordan, from Nebraska. Question is for you. Yes. It wasn't that long ago, in 2017, when you were running for your first election, that you said if there was going to be a streetcar, that you were going to I did. I don't hear a whole of people in this message. I did. And you know what I said, Joe, at that time was the city will not build a streetcar if it requires a citywide property tax increase. And I said if the public is asked to pay, then they will be given the opportunity to vote. That's what I said. And so the public is not being asked to pay. This is not a citywide tax increase. It is not a property tax, sales tax, occupation tax increase. If you live in Amy Melton's district, District 7, District 6, District 5, those people in those districts will not pay anything for this streetcar unless they park in our parking garages and we're going to use some of that revenue to pay the operation and maintenance. I also said at that time, though, Joe, that you can't build a streetcar on a street full of potholes and that I will guarantee the taxpayers before we talk about streetcar again, we'll have a solution to fix the roads. And we did that in 2020. And I explained that earlier with the bond issue. So now we have $200 million additional that we are using. And I think you could see road improvements all over Omaha. In fact, I looked at the hotline report the other day. I think I looked at it Monday morning. And, and this astounded me for being the end of January. There was one call into the hotline for a pothole. And, you know, in 2019, when the streets were absolutely blowing up, it was thousands a week. So I think that there's evidence that we have delivered on the promise that we will fix the streets first, and we are doing that. One quick follow-up. If there was a vote of the people, would it pass? I, I, would, I would certainly hope that if we got the information out and understood the importance of downtown development and understood, again, that this, well, it disappeared, but that big building, uh, you know, between a, a 40 and 50-story building, or any other building on that site would not occur without a streetcar. As I said before, that parking is choking downtown development. And now with the mall opening up, Heartland of America Park and the landing will be opening up in May of 23. Now is the time to do it because now is when people are looking to go downtown. And you know what else is important is when you know, Mutual could build anywhere. They could build way out West Omaha. But it's so important with their 4,000 plus employees that they are keeping that business and that employment in the downtown core. It's closer to North Omaha. It's closer to South Omaha. That's why that development of the urban core is so important. And that's why it's so important that we move forward now. And like I said, if, if nobody told me how to pay for it, and now I've got a sound finance plan that will work, and it'll pay for construction and operation and maintenance. So now's the time. Excuse me, I have to get a drink. Oh, no. <laughs>
And th this is tea. It's, it's, it's not beer. So, Mayor, um, all of this, isn't this contingent on the city council vote on approving the, li the new location of the library and that whole plan that's coming in at the next meeting? So do you have that approval? You know, I, well, the, the thing that Michelle Bandur is asking is about, is this all contingent upon the move of the library? Um, we will be moving the Dale Clark Library. You know, we tried, um, we, uh, the library did a facility study years ago, and it showed that it should be moved. It showed that that building was inefficient, um, and they, su they suggested a new downtown library branch of 30,000 square feet, around 30,000 square feet in close proximity of the current library. Um, there really isn't another site downtown that we can find that works like this site does. Currently at that site, 1401 Jones Street, um, there are three bus lines that come right now within one block of that library site. So there's access there before that library site at 1401 uh, Jones is open. We will be working with Metro for more frequent stops in that area. Um, you know, and another thing I have to mention is I remembered back when we were talking about HDR being downtown. Do you remember a lot of the conversation was, why in the world do you, do you want to tear down these old buildings and build new ones? Why don't you rehab old buildings? I mean, they even brought back Jobbers Canyon during that discussion, if you remember. That's what we're doing. You know, we found a building, the right size, the right location, and we are going to rehab this building. It's a temporary site. Uh, we have a five-year lease, but it could be a permanent site. But I think is, you know, the city council, I briefed them last week uh, about all of this. They're very well aware of how this all works together now and how important it is to move forward with the lease agreements. So do you feel like you have the full support of the council to get all of this approved I, by May 10th? You know what? I can't speak for the council, nor would I ever speak for the council. But when I briefed them, I think James and I felt like... Um, they were as excited as we were. Uh, Richard Nefers, uh, Tom Beck with Fox 42. During COVID, more and more people are working from home. There's yep. a lot of questions about the future of commercial real estate. What makes you so optimistic to build a, a project of this magnitude, especially since a lot of people, people are working from home? Mm -hmm. That's right. Uh, we have been fortunate through the pandemic to have most of our staff work <laughs> remotely. It's not the optimal work model for many of them. We've really embraced a flexible work uh, attitude. The, the pandemic has taught us that we can really do that, that we can be effective doing that. Uh, but we have a number of people who want to be in person full time. I put myself in that category, frankly. We have a number of people who want to work a hybrid schedule. We have people who want to flex in and flex out different days of the week and different times of the day. Uh, so we're really embracing full flexibility, first and foremost. That flexibility, we're working with uh, interior design architects, HOK, to help us understand and model that out in terms of what our real need will be. But our current facility is significantly larger. We actually lease some of our space out in Midtown today. Uh, so this new facility will be sized appropriately for our workforce, and we're really excited about that. And we are confident and optimistic, so thank you, Mr. Can, Becker, for that question. Can you mention the current your current site? Well, uh, in terms of the square footage? No, about what your plans are for the Oh, site. yeah, so I, I, I tried to make that comment early on, but we do plan on redeveloping Midtown. Now, us personally, developers will do that. But if you think about it, that site is just really prime right on the streetcar line. Uh, it can bring a lot of housing. One of the things that we saw when we did Midtown Crossing, you all might remember that in development that we've done, is really a, a change in the whole neighborhood for the better. And uh, we'd like to continue to see that grow and develop. And so developing, redeveloping uh, our current properties is really part of this whole plan. It's not part of what uh, we've announced today. We'll have to do more further study on what that will look like. Uh, but we're really excited about that. When we uh, built in Midtown Crossing, we attracted a lot of people to Midtown Crossing. So one of the, another advantage of a streetcar line is those folks who live in Midtown and work in Mutual Omaha can now just jump on the streetcar line and, and go downtown. They don't have to drive and park. So you see how this is one little example of this mobility system and how it works. The other thing is we'll have more people, new people, who want to live downtown. And so it'll create development for housing and all that. The same things we saw in Midtown Crossing, I believe, will be replicated here with this with this development. Mm -hmm. So Mr. thank Blackledge, you. Did you tell the mayor no streetcar, no building? No. I told the mayor that the streetcar enables us to consider this move downtown. And, you know, I, and I want to mention, too, that, that the plan, uh, 
I'm, I'm not sure if you mentioned this or not, but you have 4,000-plus 4, uh, 4, employees, and the plan is that they, they will occupy this building. There will be no other tenants. They're not looking at, for other tenants to occupy this building. This building will be Mutual of Omaha's building. And at, at, I also want to say that Mutual of Omaha has been such a good corporate partner, and I want to thank you all. I mean, you and your predecessor, um, you remember when they built Midtown Crossing, that area at Midtown, they, there was a lot of crime at that time. And they took a risk in a huge $300 million investment in Midtown. And look at what it looks like now. So Mutual has definitely been a very good corporate partner, a, an investment, did a huge amount of investment in the community. And what they are planning to do downtown, like I said, will be game changing now and forever in the future. Yeah, we're, uh, we're anxious to get started once we break ground, which we think will be in January after the library site is cleared. Uh, it'll be about a three-year process, so we would hope to occupy early in 2026. And how much? Sorry? I'm sorry, how much is it all costing? We don't have a final uh, sizing of the building or design. This is a conceptual rendering, so we don't have final numbers. But it'll be, uh, you know, what you would see a normal, uh, you know, cost per square foot probably, likely $500, $550 per square foot to build this out. Do you think it'll be taller than the first national tower? <laughs> uh, yeah, I have a very bad sense of humor, y'all, and I apologize for this. He, he's an actuary. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think the the right thing to do, and I and Wikipedia is my source of journalistic integrity, so you all <laughs> understand that this is not a, a you know a right number. But I think their tower is listed at 634 feet tall. I think the really winning uh, swing here would be to have another building that was exactly 634 feet tall. <laughs> because then when you ask what's the tallest building in town, you wouldn't be like, we had to build a building that was taller and it'd be mm -hmm. all that kind of you know mm -hmm. garbage about why we did that. It would be about, you have to list both First National Bank of Omaha, which we think the world of, and you'd have to list Mutual of Omaha. And so we both get press if we were both <laughs> the same height. So I don't know. The short answer is I think it'll be that scale. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and mm -hmm. that's what we're working on. The, the floor plate of the mutual building is taller than the one for First National. So it, it's hard to say how many stories and how high because it might be higher and it may have the same amount of stories. So it's, it's just a little unknown at this time. Besides the construction jobs, will you be adding other jobs with your headquarters being moved and being in the smaller well, building? Uh, Mr. Becca's question earlier is right on. We've seen a lot of uh, growth in remote workers outside of Omaha. And we expect that to continue with our national footprint. We're able to, in our national brand, we're able to attract a lot of talent outside of Omaha. But we feel really confident that we'll be able to maintain our workforce in Omaha, maybe grow it a little bit. So uh, when uh, Mayor Stothert talks about 4,000 people, we have 4,000 people who would call Omaha their main location today. Uh, we have about another 3,500 across the country. So keep that in mind as we talk about these numbers. Um, but yeah, we do expect roughly 4,000 people to be in that downtown facility. Mayor, can you talk a little bit, I'm sorry, Aaron Sanders, you can you talk a little bit about the financing for the streetcar? You made mention briefly about the uh, parking might be used uh, to help offset the operating costs. Right, will there be a price increase for parking? How will it cover those costs? You know, that, that's, that's really undetermined, but you know, we have in our city code that all of our fees no matter if it's parking or in the planning department should be reviewed annually and, and adjusted. Um, but how that works, and it's a bit complicated, but there are certain expenses that are TIF eligible. You can't use it for capital. But we can, what we can, what we have right now with our current parking garages is the city is paying the debt service on it. We can use that additional TIF that the streetcar will generate to pay the debt off on our parking garages and then the total revenue will go to pay for the operation and maintenance and so we're not using the revenue to pay the debt service the TIF will help pay off the debt service and then as I said before we have a lot of other garages that are in planning or under construction and that will only add to the revenue so it's the revenue from our garages and the revenues from the meters Mayor you mentioned a lot of other businesses were interested in that, in that site uh, were any of them from out of town that would be bringing headquarters here to Omaha? Uh, part one of the question, and part two, are these other businesses looking at other downtown locations now uh, to uh, relocate? You know, um, most of them that expressed are, are, are local, but they do have developments in other states. And so they could build anywhere, and they have expressed interest in that library site. Um, 
and, and really good interest in that library side. But again, all of them said, we can't do this the way it is now with the current parking. So it, that's why it's so important. Your second question, I'm sorry. Are they Tom? still looking at downtown development? Then? Yes, you yeah, you know, and, and, uh, and uh, one thing that I, I didn't mention, but I think it's worth mentioning now, is the, the first site that Mutual was looking at was the old UP site that is shovel ready, the old Wall Street Tower site downtown. And you know, the one thing, again, the, com the complicated thing was parking and the need for a streetcar to move people around. And we even discussed, is it possible to do another loop to include that area where the old UP site was? And the answer was, wouldn't it be just the perfect solution to put, instead of using the old UP site for First National, to bring First National to the Dale Clark Library site where the streetcar line is already planned? And so there, we, what we are going to do is we're going to do basically a land swap. And so Jason Lanaha with Lanaha Development um, owns the, 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 uh, the UP site. And what we will do is we'll basically, we haven't had a current appraisal recently. We will appraise, but we estimate that those two properties are going to be essentially the same in value. And we're going to do a land swap. We will give Mutual the Dale Clark Library site, which we own. And then the city of Omaha will get back that we had before, the old UP site. And so yes, that site there is another site that we want to develop downtown, and that's a perfect site for another business downtown. Mayor, the people who, who complained about the library switching, they kind of said, because of all this downtown development and the moving that's taking place, all of this is a big done deal. Given your announcements this, this morning, don't they have a point? What do you mean a big done deal? You know, Joe, that, in city government or in any kind of development that we do, and we do a ton of development. You know, our, our, our planning department is busy all the time. And there is a process for every single development. It goes through the planning board, it goes to the city council for approval, there are questions, there are adjustments, there is TIF application, there's a TIF committee. All of those things happen with every development that we have, whether it's downtown or out west. And so, yeah, you know, yeah, it has to go through a certain process. Is it a done deal? It's never a done deal until everything is approved. So I don't like to, I don't like to talk about um, hypothetical situations. I don't like to, to dwell on what if, what if, what if. I mean, what if we have another pandemic next year? What, I, you know, you got to play the hand you're dealt. And so what we are planning on is keeping the city council brief. They will know everything we know. We will use the same process we use for every development to get city council approval. But I do think our city council understands the great value and how all this works together. But keep in mind, the Dale Clark Library site, even our director, Laura Marlene, who's here today, she testified yesterday that she's been in the library business a long time and she's never seen such opportunity downtown. And if we could deliver a new library branch downtown that is exactly what their facility study said they wanted, there is not a lot of space downtown and there isn't anything along Dodge where the current bus route goes. Um, there isn't. And you know, unless we would put the library in some high rise building of somebody else's on the second or third floor, this is the best site downtown. There's not much down there. And so I anticipate that these things will be approved. Mr. Blackley, did Mutual consider leaving Omaha, or because of the name Mutual of Omaha, are you pretty much fixated here? Well, I, I think I'd answer that a different way. We, we haven't seriously considered it ever, I don't think, leaving Omaha. But uh, what's happening to us rather than with us is, again, our business is getting to be more and more national because of remote work and other things like that. So, you know, you think about alternatives to building a site. Now, we really believe bringing people together for, uh, periodically at least is, is going to help our customers and really help uh, productivity, creativity, all those things. Uh, but, you know, an alternative is just simply not to build anything and to distribute, you know, whatever facilities we have all across the country and find talent wherever it is. That's kind of anti-development uh, in terms of what we want for Nebraska. We want people to be attracted to come live in Nebraska. It's a great place. We believe that. So I think that's the way I would frame the alternative, Joe. It's more, it's more in terms of that. It's, uh, frankly, you know, a lot of questions I get is, why don't you just not have a big real estate footprint, not even make an investment, rent a little bit of space all across the country wherever your people want to work, and go that route. We think there's a lot of value to bringing people together 
uh, for our customers, and that's why we're doing this commitment. I, I really want to reemphasize with this streetcar that this is nothing that just came about because of mutual or any other business. We have been working on this since 2009 and before, and it took a lot of work and a lot of study, and a lot of these people that are in this room now has spent a lot of time, effort, research, analysis on the feasibility and how we would pay for and the need for the streetcar. And it's just all coming together right now. And, and when I, when I, I like I said, I, I was presented with a plan of here's how we can fund the construction, here's how we can fund the operation and maintenance. It works. It doesn't require a tax increase. <coughs> Only those along the route will be affected. Um, then, then it was a win-win for everybody. I had a, 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 just a follow-up question when uh, Tom asked about the, or you asked the mayor about the redevelopment of the current property. Mm -hmm. Are you going to continue to own that property, or are you going to sell it to developers, or what's the situation? Uh, Yes. Uh, we will, uh, over time, uh, likely sell off all the property we have in Midtown uh, to developers to redevelop different parcels of it. That will start, ultimately, once all the approvals come through and, frankly, when we break ground and are committed you know, to going forward on the new building. So we're hoping to get rapid approvals so we can accelerate that process as well. John, I didn't hear your question. Um, in terms of the construction for the street, right? Uh huh. You mentioned some bonds, but also private land for the bonds right. used for the construction. Can you expand on that at all? Sure. I mean, what we are hoping is those private placement bonds and for the special revenue bonds that there will be a market uh, with philanthropy to purchase those bonds. As far as needing philanthropy to fund the construction or operation and maintenance, that's not part of our finance plan, though. Mayor Aaron, again, can you tell me a little bit about how? I know there's probably some discussion, and time you use tip at this magnitude, there's probably discussion with other taxing entities. Uh, what sort of uh, efforts were made to make the school districts or other taxing entities whole? Yeah, Aaron, Aaron that, that's a good question. And he asked, um, you know, other taxing entities can be affected by TIF. We, do, we approve TIF all the time with a 15-year note. Like I said, uh, the legislature allowed us to expand in extremely blighted areas to a 15-year payoff on the note which that area is extremely blighted. I did talk to Dr. Logan about it, gave her a heads up, uh, told her what we were doing. The important thing is, everybody with TIF, and I think all of you that understand TIF knows, you can't take something away you don't have. Uh, you know, the, the school districts will get the base amount in this route where the streetcar is that they do now. They will get that amount. We will expand that payoff, the total payoff, from 15 years to 20, except you add that additional five years, their windfall is going to be much more after 20 than it is after 15. We also worked into the finance plan that in that period from 15 years to 20, we also have a pass-through that the school districts will get 2% more per year of the increased TIF revenue during that five-year period. So they will be guaranteed that. And so they will get more revenue every year. And then at the end of that 20-year payoff for the note, their windfall will be much greater than it would after 15 years. Now, and you, and you again, with TIF, you cannot say, look at a 15-year period or a 20-year period and say this is lost revenue because that revenue, that increased valuation isn't there. It's not there. And they will continue to get that base amount what the revenue or what the valuation is in the district now, they will continue to get that. But they, again, I stress, they will get 2% more per year over that additional five year period. So they will be guaranteed to get more. Brian? Mayor, Brian, Mass 316. What do you anticipate that still could derail something like this, either the streetcar <coughs> or Mutual of Omaha? I just remember the last big tall building we were going to build downtown. She, you know, Brian asked if, if I anticipate anything that could derail this. I don't like to think about that right now. You know, I mean, we, of course, there's all sorts of scenarios. Like I said before, it's, it's hard to deal with a hypothetical situation and say, what if this happened or what if that happened? All I can say right now is we feel like this has been studied and studied and studied. We know the need. We have a finance plan that is very solid right now, and we have a lot of research that has gone into what our estimates are. And like I said, there's 40, I said 40, I think believe there's 42 cities, or uh, I think 42, 
um, across the country that either have a streetcar or are building a streetcar. And in every one of them, the revenue projections exceeded what the estimates were. The streetcars do work, and we know that. So, so uh, we're, we're moving forward with the, with the data that we have, with the research that we have, with the analysis that we have, and looking at what other cities, the success with other cities. And that's what, that's what we're moving forward with. I mean, you can, like I said, you can always say, wonder if there's another pandemic next year. I mean, you just, you, you just don't know. Is there another city that fits this model that you're keeping an eye on? The, the model of the streetcar, the model of the finance plan. Well, you know, I mean, other, other cities have streetcars, that's for sure. Um, you know, the cars will look different than they originally did. They're a little bit sleeker looking, I think. Um, the cars have to be ordered within a, a, you know, a very short period of time because it takes years for them to come in. Um, but every city and every state, well, I would say every state, not every city, is different. You know, we look very closely at Kansas City, who is, a, is our neighbor and has a very successful streetcar that they're expanding now. But their funding model is different than ours because they have different state laws. For instance, they have a 1% dedicated sales tax that goes to funding their streetcar. We can't do that. You know, right? You know, the state uh, sales tax is 5.5%. City has a local option of 1.5%. And we, as a metropolitan class city, are capped at our 7%. We can't go any higher with a sales tax. We'd have to get state law changed and go to a vote of the people. So every state has different funding plans based on what their state law is. So we are doing what we can do here. Other questions? There's a lot of people in this room, too, if anybody has questions for the developer or the planning. Mr. Director? Yeah. Question. You mentioned you said you were going to sell the property as mutual to a developer. Does that include Midtown Crossing as well, or just the headquarters and everything uh, west of there? Actually, everything, but we've already sold off several parcels of Midtown Crossing. It's been an ongoing process. Uh, we sold the hotel, the apartments, almost all the condos are sold. So what we have left at Midtown Crossing is relatively small. Mm -hmm. Other questions? You are a quiet bunch today. Right. Yeah, eventually it'll be owned by Mutual of Omaha as part of our development. Uh, there will be a probably a, at least a two-step process to get there, but Cindy, so I don't know exactly. Can you hear him? Yeah, yeah. 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 James, you got to come here. You got to got to coach me up. Sorry, folks. Uh, uh, eventually, it'll all be owned by Mutual of Omaha. The, the, but it's just a, there'll be a process to get there. I don't know if I know all the details of that process, but uh, you know, it'll start out where the swap between the lots is between the developer and the city. Mm -hmm. And then shortly thereafter, I would imagine we would acquire it as part of the development. Mm -hmm. Does that help? Is that? Yes. And can I ask, do you anticipate 4,000 employees being in the building? Yeah. Or how many stories you're talking about, but will you be having room also for additional employees? Yeah. For, for growth in that building? Yeah. So uh, Cindy asked if, uh, if we would have all 4,000 people in the building and if we would anticipate additional growth on top of that 4,000 number. And the short story is we don't expect to have on any given day all 4,000 people in the building at the same time. So what we'd expect is a, you know, something like two-thirds of that number probably has more of a peak high water mark in terms of any given day based on new ways of working with the remote and the hybrid and all that. But it'll be a, it'll be a smaller number on any given day. We would expect most of those 4,000 people to come into the building at different points in time for different activities. And so, uh, so that's the way I would try to frame the 4,000. Uh, we will have some uh, modest room for expansion, but uh, we don't expect significant growth in that location. Uh, we would hope to have it, and we'd hope to be, uh, you know, looking to uh, expand at some point if, if business continues to grow. We've been growing very, very well over the last couple of decades, frankly, thanks to my predecessor and all the hard work our associates do. But, but uh, that's a, that building will be designed more to our current footprint than it will be for a lot of growth. Mm -hmm. Does that help? Okay, thank you. you know, I wanted to add to, I think, a question Tom Becca asked a while ago about other businesses looking downtown. The one thing I do want to mention is our plans all along, since the Gene Leahy Mall is being expanded all the way to the river through Heartland of America Park, that's a lot of land. 
So our plan all along was to, to develop the Dale Clark site, but also to develop the block just east of the Dale Clark site that now is currently part of the Jean Leahy Mall because we can do that. And so, um, you know, that area right there that would be between Mutual and the park is also being considered for development because we have a lot of green space because of how we're expanding the park. Now, I did tell James we could put a 60-story building there in front of that. No, I didn't. But, uh, there, the, you know, the, of course, whatever is built there, we will work with it and, and coordinate with First National. But that space right there is prime, too. Yeah, maybe a one-story building right there or something. But, no, but that's, that's, a, that's an excellent spot, too, for development. So that's, that's always been in our plan. Mr. Blackledge, will there be any public access to the building, particularly with over the top and look out over the area? Uh, ooh. ooh. Yeah, that's okay. Um, to, to think it's unfettered public access would be would not be the way to think about it. To be invited public into the building, yeah, we'll do certain events and things that will invite people in so that they can enjoy that. Absolutely. Uh, Mr. Jordan asked about uh, public access, like to the top of the building, to have those views. I think is the, the, so. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. It is. Uh, Michelle asked about my vision downtown, and you know, when I, I first ran for mayor in 2012 and 2013, I talked about wanting to revitalize the riverfront. I was just talking about Lewis and Clark Landing, but to put something down on the riverfront that would bring people down there every single day of the year. And with the help of the, the, the riverfront revitalization, I know Moen's Bay is here today that has been instrumental in getting the riverfront developed. With that being developed, we knew that we would see what we saw when the Jean Leahy Mall was first built back in the 70s, I believe it was. And you know, it was, it was built with money from HUD for a green space program that no longer exists. But what we saw when that Jean Leahy Mall was built downtown, it sparked development. And um, you know what, when that was built, what had happened is businesses and residents were moving out of downtown. And uh, what happened during that period of time, Crossroads was built, you know, five miles west. And people started moving their businesses out of downtown. Then they started moving back in again. And now that's what we are going to see again, and we're already seeing it. Look at, um, look at our, the landmark building, you know, right across from the Jean Leahy Mall. And we know there is a lot of interest that will spark because of this development downtown. And that's why it's just so vital that we deal with the parking problem now. And you know, with the Dale Clark site, again, I have to mention all these developers that have expressed some interest. Number one question, when can that site be cleared so that we could start? When, when's the earliest it can be cleared? So that's why all of this works together. And if we didn't have a good spot for a downtown library, I would, I, you know, I, I would, well, I will say this, I will make sure that we have a good spot for a downtown library. We're not getting rid of the downtown library, we're moving it and we're making it more efficient and we are working with the library board of trustees and the director and we are uh, complying with what their facilities study showed. And it's a good thing for all of downtown. You know, a downtown library changes. That building down there is, like I said, is very inefficient <coughs> and you build a library to suit your customers and the customers downtown, the type of customers are changing. You know, it, it just gives, like I said, our total mobility plan, it gives another option. Um, you know, what young professionals, uh, uh, what businesses, what labor is looking for when they're, what businesses are looking for when they're looking for a new city to move to, they look at all of those things. They, they look at public transportation. They look at parking. They look at amenities. They look at entertainment. They look at residential areas. They look at, they, they're very, very interested in the urban core. I mean, look at even with the steel house going up downtown. There's a lot uh, with, with what's going on at the ConAgra campus. There's a lot going on. It's attracting a lot more people downtown, but we have to solve the parking problem. That's what's attractive about it to me. And what makes it really attractive to me is we could pay for it, and we could pay for it without a tax increase, and that was in really important to me. Mayor, you said the streetcar up and running in 2026. Mutual building a few years in that, in that range? Mutual, I would say, I mean, the plan would be 26 for both of them, hopefully. 
Well, unless you run for re-election, you won't be mayor then. <laughs> I, you know, you're speculating again, Joe. He said I won't be mayor then. <laughs> I'm not saying a word. <laughs> Oh my goodness, Aaron. Aaron asked about what, what's the, the, I think you said the value of securing a Fortune 500 company. I mean, it, it's a huge value to a, a city like Omaha that is growing and developing. And, you know, we want to attract more businesses and we want to attract more labor and we want to attract more residents. Omaha is growing. And we knew that by the census. More people, and we, a lot of it is because of the annexation plan that we have. But to keep a Fortune 500 company, in, in Omaha, and then to get them to move downtown is of great value to the city of Omaha now and in the future. And to have, you know, mutual, uh, again, that's reviewed every year, which are our Fortune 500 companies, and it's all based on their annual revenue. And, and mutual has stayed up there um, for many, many, many years, and we hope that they stay up there and that they stay in Omaha, and I think this is pretty much a guarantee. One thing I wanted to show you here on this rendering, just so you know, is this here at the base, that is parking. So parking is included in the design of their building. It, the skin on it looks exactly like the building though, so it doesn't stand out to look like a big concrete parking garage. So they are building parking within that building, but still it's 2,500 stalls and they need more. Uh, Lanaha Development owns it. Jason Lanaha's here. He owns it now. Um, he's been working with Mutual of Omaha. Um, that site was looked at and evaluated and, and actually um, moving towards that site to do the, this building on that site. But when we got into conversations with both Jason Lanaha and James, um, it became very apparent that the spot that Mutual needed to build that building was on the Dale Clark site. Remember, we own that Dale Clark building. We own the land that it sits on. And so it just made sense to make this much easier to do it, is we would take back that old UP site and we would let them then move into and take over the Dale Clark site. Mm -hmm. Do we have any plans for the old site? Oh, we talked about that earlier, Cindy, but we said, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of interest downtown and that site is just prime for development and it is shovel ready right now. There's nothing I could say that is absolute right now as far as do we have any plans for the old UP site right now. Right now, Jason still owns it. <laughs> but that, that, that is all, you know, like I said, this is a lot of people have been involved with this and working literally every day for years on this. And so it's really exciting to announce both of these, both of these announcements together because it all works together. Is that it? Oh. Mr. Blackfish, can you talk a little bit about the value of the streetcar? You said a little bit in your statement, but uh, how pivotal was that in getting you to move from Midtown and making the choice that you could leave the property that you helped develop? Yeah, I, I think that's the way I would describe it. Certainly there are economic benefits to having a streetcar. We, I mentioned a couple examples earlier, and there's a lot that goes into this, so I won't bore you with all the details. But if we don't have to have another 500 parking spaces, that helps. Uh, uh, you know, so there's things like that that help. But the real issue for me personally was our commitment to Midtown and all the things we've developed there and all the great neighbors we have there and trying to make sure that we had something that really uh, spoke to the ongoing need to continue to grow and develop in Midtown. And so uh, that is what to me is really the linchpin to having the streetcar, what it really does. Uh, if we were simply to move out of Midtown and not have a, a mobility solution like that, I'm just afraid that you would have a bunch of empty vacant lots and uh, an empty building and things like that. And we don't want that. We want it to be very much a vibrant neighborhood that we've started to create there. So thank you. We're going to take just two more questions after an hour. So two more. Any other? Or no more. <laughs> <laughs> Well, again, I, I, I just want to thank publicly Mutual of Omaha for their investment in the past in Omaha, um, 4,000 employees plus in Omaha, 
and their commitment to invest and stay in Omaha and what this development will mean for downtown now and, and for decades and decades into the future. So, James, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you all for being here.